name is Christian Gross, and I'm going to be giving a talk about uh, something completely different. It's about Node.js. How many of you have heard about Node.js? Okay, I kind of expected that. That's why you're here. How many of you have heard that it's the best thing since sliced bread? It's really awesome, man. How many have heard that? Okay, a few of you. Um, that's not what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about Node.js, but I'm going to try to actually give you an understanding of what Node.js is. Um, how many of you today program in F Sharp? Okay. You see, for him, he can just walk out the room because he'll know already what I'm going to get at. You see, Node.js is a trend in the programming community to go towards functional type programming. If you've done F sharp, you know what it's all about. It's relatively straightforward. There's a certain programming paradigm. But since you've done F sharp, how much is F sharp like C sharp? Nothing. Different concepts, correct? Are they better or are they worse? Or are they just, well, it's different concepts. But, but you see, okay, do you see? He's not jumping out and saying, it's awesome. What he's saying is saying, look, I'm a programmer. I'm actually doing this, really. And while some things might be worse, some things are better, it's not like as if C Sharp or those other programming languages don't have a reason. And that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about what the reason of Node.js. Of course, I'll do some demos with Node.js and I'll show some things. But I really want you to get an understanding of what Node.js represents. Because if you understand that, the rest is just APIs. Right? I mean, I'm not going to sit here and go, oh, look, here's how you open a, con a socket. Uh -huh. Oh, look, here's how you make um, the lights turn on. You know, I mean, that's kind of boring, right? You want to understand the, the abstract, the, the, the context. All right, so let's, st that's what I want to do with my agenda. About me, I have consulted software companies. I've been building web apps since about 95, 96, when it was called the Data Highway. Um, in my last session, I was actually reminiscing a lot about the past. You're going to understand why at the end. Um, these days, I manage my own money and write my own algos. All right, so what is Node.js? Here's what the propaganda says. Node.js says, it is a platform built on Chrome's JavaScript runtime for easily building fast, scalable network application. Node.js uses an event-driven, non-blocking I.O. model that makes it lightweight and efficient, perfect for data-intensive, real-time applications that run across distributed devices. Really? That's a lot of big words. You know, a lot of big words put together in a lot of big ways. So the question really becomes, what are you actually really trying to tell me? And that's the interesting part. You see, because I could say, wow, I can build a kick bud web application that scales for me. Woo, -hoo, really? OK. So let's just build a quick web application. Let's, let's jump into it and see what goes on. Well, the first thing that you have to do is you have to download Node.js. And the way you do that is you go to their website, nodejs.org. And if there's one thing I really, really like about this website is that it's easy. You see the big install button? You click it, okay? You can't mess that one up. Once you've installed that, you actually get two programs. You get, from the command line, Node, which right now is a JavaScript interpreter. And you get NPM, which is actually a package manager. Um, I think the closest thing in the .NET world to Node PM is, um, what's the .NET one, the package manager? There's one for .NET, huh? NuGet, thank you. It's similar, it runs along that line. You see, if I was to sit there and talk to you, oh, it's the DB, DB in packaging system, you'd go, eh? What are you trying to tell me? The NuGet, it's similar to that. So if you understand NuGet, you can understand how to use this one. I'm not saying NuGet is like this. I'm just saying if you understand how to use NuGet, 
This is getting along the similar lines. So in this case, what I did is I actually have both of them pre-installed. And what I want to do is I actually want to sit there and create a web app. And interestingly, if you scroll down the page a bit, look what you have, source code. Let's copy this. Oops, no. Where is it? Escape, file, new. There we go. I paste it. I do a file save as. And let's go in there. Let's go into documents. Where is my documents? There it is. Let's go into Basta. Let's go into Node.js. Let's go into hand coded. And then we type in um, example.js. There we go. Now the gedit has recognized the syntax, that it's actually JavaScript. And if I was to go down to the command line, I look in a directory, I see it, I go node example.js. And as you see right now, server is running at the local host 1337. So if I use a web browser, 1337, and I get hello world. And it's that straightforward. That's it. You got a running web server. Doesn't do much other than say hello world, just keep saying hello world, hello world, hello world. But it is a full functional web server. Let's look at a little bit at the source code because this is where things get a little interesting. This source code, when you kind of look at it, you're kind of like, eh? Ignore the source code a bit. Let's just write some JavaScript, okay? Um, just to give you an idea. I'm going to define an object. There. That you probably understand. What basically I'm sitting there doing is I'm sitting there saying, I instantiating an object of my object type, that this is in JavaScript notation. What I can also do is say, I can define a method. So when I instantiate the object, I can call up this method. This we all get. This is object-oriented programming. This is classical, you know, instantiate, call the method, away we go. Here's where things get a bit funky. If you've done Lambda programming in C Sharp or you've done F Sharp programming, you're going to be feeling right at home. Because what I'm going to do now is I'm going to say, I have a callback. And so what essentially I can do is I can sit there and say, do something, and then I can do Like that. See, my method takes in this CB, which it considers a function. What basically means is I call up this object, I, uh, sorry, I call up the method of the object, and the object method, uh, sorry, the method of the, uh, gets in a function callback. And in this case, the function callback has a variable and I'm going to process this variable, where I might do like console.log. There. In JavaScript, in JavaScript, um, what you have is 
you have the ability to almost define anything as objects, and functions are objects. This is really along the lines of F-sharp, where you're going. And what I'm doing right now is I'm calling up the object, uh, so I'm calling up the object within a method. This is the heart of Node.js. This is what it's all about. Do you see up here how we have create server? This function call, right here, this creates your server. This is where you, you process the request. So in here you have a request object and a response object, and then you just sit there, well, I'm going to ignore the request, I'm just going to write out to the response, and I'm going to write a header, uh, status code 200, with this. This here is an anonymous object. And in this object I have a number of property values. And the HTML that I'm writing, which is really not HTML, I'm just writing text plain, is hello world. Does anyone not understand that concept? Does everyone get that concept of JavaScript? Any questions on it? Because it's really key that you understand that. Questions? Going once, going twice, gone. All right. So. We understand this concept. It's going to sit there and call back. It's going to process. What else can we do? How else does this go? All right. I ran it. This is the simple web server. It's the functional approach we're implemented as callbacks. You probably will be looking at this and going, OK, this is interesting. It's a very simple web server, but you know what? You're using gedit. Uh, give me a break. Um, I want a real IDE. So what can I do to use a real IDE? The answer is WebStorm. Uh, some of you might have heard of ReSharper, okay? the, the product ReSharper from, Intelli uh, from uh, JetBrains. Well, JetBrains has another product called WebStorm. Let's go here. And here we go. WebStorm, this one. They call it the smartest JavaScript IDE. It's actually a really good uh, JavaScript IDE. It's great for sitting there and doing HTML, JavaScript, and cascading style sheets. But also what it does is things like Jade. Now you are going, Jade, what's that? That's a templating system for Node.js. I'll get to that as well. So let's go in, let's go to WebStorm. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to actually create a new project. And what I'm going to use is the Node.js boilerplate. Uh, that's the parlay uh, in um, uh, the talk where it says, I'm going to give you the basic uh, application. So I sit there and I go, OK. It's going to sit there, yep, on that one. Uh, let's do new window. It's basically now gotten the entire boilerplate. It's got it ready, but something else needs to be done. Right now, it's very rudimentary. You actually need to run the init project.sh. So we'll go back to the co command line. And I called it another project. And I need to run init project. What it's now doing is it's using the NPM manager, the, the Node.js package manager, and it's downloading all of the latest versions of the J templates, the libraries, and so on. You can sit there and put in your own uh, scripts to do this, but WebStorm does it for you automatically, and it's quite nice, because you see right here, look, it's getting Sakurai.io, it's getting Connect, it's getting Mongoose, it's getting Jade, it's getting Mocha Express, and, and, and. All right. So now when I go back, it sits there and says, okay, hey, great. Um, everything's hunky-dory except for Git. Don't use Git, I use Subversion. We have now a project. This is a project where you can see it's starting to make quite a few Node.js calls. And here's where things get a little tricky because it's using all of these new keywords like require, the express create server, OBK, we kind of saw that before. We have air, but notice how everything is a callback. 
from top to bottom. It's all about callbacks. So what I now want to do is I actually want to run this. Now normally, to run it, I could go back to the command line and I could just sit there and say run server.js because that's the main application. In Node.js, there is no such real concept of, oh, this is a main program. In Node.js, the main program is whatever script you run. So in this case, if you look at it, the main script that I run is server.js. It's just nomenclature. Then within server.js, what you see are references to things like connect. Well, that's a library, that's a, no, no, a module that I need. Do I have it? Oh, look, here it is, connect. Do I have express? Yes, I do. Do I have socket IO? Yes, I do. So you see, you could actually have within this directory three or four different main, main applications. It just depends on what you run. So in this case, I'm going to run server.js. And I would actually like to debug it, and the way to do that is to use the WebStorm edit, uh, uh, edit configurations. And I clap, uh, hit in and say, okay, I have a Node.js application. And let's just name it uh, main server. It knows where to get node. It knows what the working directory is. And now it wants to know path to node app JS file. It's just a script that it actually wants. So in this case, I go into another project and I go into server.js. And I choose this. I apply it. And now when I go back, I see here there's a little uh, configuration item saying I have a configuration that where I can debug. So if I now put a breakpoint in and hit run, there we go. It debugs. So you can go through and debug and see what's working, what's not working. I'm going to just continue so it's now running. I go to the console and Oh, error in use. What's running 8081? Okay, let me uh, let me change to the port. Why is it? All right. Um, hit run. There we go. Listening on 8082. So now I go in. There you go. It kicks in, it's loaded an HTML page, and it's up and running. I, again, I can debug, and I can run, and everything would be kind of hunky-dory right now. You would say, oh, great, I can start programming, I can start being productive. Okay, I'm going to do an interesting test. Do you see here how I hit refresh? And actually, there's data that gets generated. You can see it in the debug window. You, Seems okay, right? Let, let, let's, let's experiment. Let's go a little bit further. I have here res get slash. What basically this is, uh, is doing is if I call up basically any URL, here's the handler. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a render and it's going to be based on Jade. That is all hunky dory. What I want to do is I want to introduce some pre-canned code I have here. Because you're going to see something interesting. OK, let me first copy this. Let's put this under another. And what we're going to do is your page title. I'm going to go another page title. All right, so then I go into the browser here. Uh, go back. Actually, I need to run it again. I'm going to go into the browser, hit refresh, got a message. Let's open up a second browser. And what I want to do now is I want to go localhost 8082 slash another. Another page title. Do you see? 
your page title, another page title. I can hit refresh, no problem. I get it again. What I want to do, I want to put this loop in. Can someone tell me what this loop does? What, is it, what does it do? It's actually rather simple. Don't overthink it. Seriously, don't overthink it. What does it do? Come on, say it. I'm sorry? Waste CPU time. Good for you. Exactly. It wastes CPU time. All it does is it just runs and runs and runs and runs and runs. If I have a web server and one URL just gets me to page content and another URL wastes CPU time, what do you expect to happen on the server? I'm sorry? Shh. You, you already jumped the gun. I said, if you use another type of web server, not that, you're jumping the gun. You see, he's another speaker, and he's sitting there ruining up the event, and shh, shh, shh. If you use another, if you were to use IIS, and you had this infinite loop in there, what would happen to IIS? Could it serve requests outside of the URL that does an infinite count? Yes or no? I'm sorry? Yeah, actually it can, of course it can. IIS, if you have one URL sitting there and it runs a loop and then you call it again, it'll get a request, trust me. It's called threading, right? And here's the problem. Node.js doesn't. So what I did is I added the code. Now what I'm doing is I'm gonna run. And I'm gonna sit there and say, okay, that runs, now I refresh another. You see it's sitting there waiting. Now I make the request in the other one and it's still waiting. And basically what I've done is I've locked the server. Seriously, I've completely locked it. It's not able to process any other request. At that point, you're kind of like going, eh? Who would be so stupid to create a web server like that, right? I mean, this is kind of like ridiculous. And that's actually what I want to spend some time with because one of the things that when I was sitting there uh, using Node.js and I was talking to people, this behavior is expected behavior. And at that point, really, as someone who writes multi-threading code and big systems, you're kind of like, it's expected that you can lock up the server? Yes, it is. All right, so let's continue. Let's, let's look at the slides and let's think about why this is expected behavior. All right. Um, kaboom. Kaboom. Let's go back to what Node.js talked about on their web page on uh, when they said here. Easily building uses an event-driven non-blocking. <laughs> it's blocking for lightweight and efficient. If you look at all the tests and you look at all the performances and you look at all of the Node.js supporters, what you will typically get is you'll get an attitude where they say, this is great, this is fantastic, we're faster. And at that point, you're kind of like going, okay, are we like living on different planets? You see, you would think that there's a big disconnect, but there's not. Actually, the thinking behind Node.js is a very clever, I call it, back to the roots thinking. Yes, there are issues with this kaboom, and there are ways to get around this. And that's not the topic of this. Uh, I'm not going to be talking about it here, but if you go into the Node.js community, there already, uh, there's ways to around it. But there's base thinking. And the base thinking 
is on how a CPU works. See, this, this, is, this is awesome. Uh, I'm 44 years old, and when I went through university, 1987 to 1992, as a mechanical engineer, and I did, uh, digi uh, I did automation and industrial design, we got to see these diagrams. And these diagrams showed how a CPU works. And basically what it's talking about is how does a CPU time slice a program? Now, these days, that type of thinking is like, do I really care? Because, you know, it's, it's an automatic thing. The operating system does it, multitasking. Yeah, but I grew up, at, well, yeah, I actually grew up in an era where we didn't have multitasking as a base default, where we had, we had to discern between single tasking and multitasking. And you see, the reality is, and I'm going to say this at a very high level. Please don't nail me on details because I know things have slightly changed. A CPU cannot multitask. All right? Now, the reason why I'm saying don't nail me is, yes, Intel has put in things, certain threading and models and inline and caching on how to actually do it. But I'm saying, generally speaking, CPUs cannot multitask. What you're actually seeing is an operating system that runs one task for a certain amount of time, stops it, freezes it, and then runs another task. And it keeps doing that, and that's what this is trying to show. They're saying each of those blocks, each of those arrows, is one program that it runs, and it has a time slice. And that's just how it goes through. You see, the thing is, is when you multitask through time slicing, it's actually inefficient. If you now say to me, oh, come on, give me a break, man. You're sitting there and you're saying it's inefficient to multitask and it's, it's, the, the old model is better. No, the reason why we have multitasking is because computers typically tend to run multiple processes concurrently. You see, in the good old days, you'd have one process, it would run, lock up the computer, and then the next process would run. Now we can multitask. But the cost of multitasking is quite high. The cost of, multi, the, the cost of multitasking is higher in terms of, I have to do a context switch. I have to sit there and think about threading. I have to think about process synchronization. That is very expensive on computationally. Now, sir, when you wrote, how much F-sharp experience do you have? Like, how much have you written? Half a year. Half a year. I'm sorry? Thank you. Beautiful. Why is a calculation so efficient with things like F-sharp? Okay, did you, did you really use a lot of threading, or did you just use the parallel libraries? Right. See, the, the thing is, is that, you see, functional languages know a trick that if you basically keep it all in a certain single thread, it can be blazing fast. Of course, having a single thread has downsides, and this is actually what I'm just trying to get at. You see, by having Node.js run in a single thread, in a single process that can be locked, there are advantages and disadvantages. The advantages is, and, I'm, and I can understand this entirely, Node.js is faster. Because it doesn't have to deal with all of the synchronization. It doesn't have to deal with all of the, memory, the, the funny memory models. You see, the way that it actually you have to look at it from the running tasks is, if I'm sitting there and running tasks, why do I need to parallelize them? Why can't I just quickly put them all into the serial? Like one after the other. Because then what ends up happening is, is that the CPU focuses on that task, runs it as quick as possible, and then gets the next task. And that's how it does. It's sort of, it, 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 it would seem almost counterintuitive, but it's not. It's actually very intuitive. Though, okay, uh, yes, though, okay, so you go on and you say, all right, I can sit there and I can do this. I can keep running these tasks. 
The next idea is, well, if I sit there with Node.js and I have to access the hard disk, I'm going to actually make it slower because accessing the hard disk is expensive. And that's where Node.js became really clever. Because what Node.js is, is as follows. If you can imagine it, it goes along. It has to access the hard disk. That is a slow operation. It will delegate that task out to a thread. There it says, okay, this is intelligent. We need to delegate this task. So then this is frozen and something else is started to process. You see, this is sort of like where things get kind of funky because what it means is there is multitasking, but not multitasking while Node.js is running. This is why it is so important to sit there and use callbacks in Node.js. Because what it does is it says, look, this is the expensive operation. I might sit there and call up the hard disk. So what I do is I sit there, I take this object, I call it. And if that object makes a callback to the hard disk, well, that instance object is frozen, we use another object and we call it until the other one is ready. What that is called, and if you are a Windows 3.1 3.1 programmer, we used to call that cooperative multitasking in a single thread. Does that ring any bells at all? Cooperative multitasking single thread? I'm looking at it, seeing a lot of blank stares. But if you want to Google it, that's what it's really called. And basically what you're doing is you're sitting there, you're multitasking, you're, but you're doing it intelligently. You're sitting there intelligently delegating off a task. That's actually what makes Node.js so blazing fast because it knows when to delegate off and when not to delegate off. The reason why this system locked is because... I was actually writing my code in JavaScript, here. You see, there's only one thread in JavaScript ever running. If I sit there and take too long in the JavaScript, well, then I got problems. You see, what a lot of Node.js developers do is they prototype in JavaScript, run it, native, run it within the Node.js script, and then they compile it and run it as a native module. And at that point, you're going, what? What do you mean compile JavaScript? Co JavaScript is run as an interpreter. No, there are ways to optimize this, and I will get to it. So, we, okay, let's go back to the presentation. You see, the advantage when you're running in a single thread with Node.js is that you never have deadlocks. Never. You never have all of these threading issues you can just access and reference variables because if you start using synchronization mechanisms and locks, that costs CPU time. All right, there is a problem with Node.js and this is where you have to understand. Node.js assumes all tasks in JavaScript are run the same length. When I make a web request, the web request sits there and hits the database. It puts all the information together on the database and then gives that information back. Now, if I have about a thousand users and they're all hitting the database, that request type is gonna take the same amount of time. It's gonna have the same pattern. So in that sense, the Node.js assumption is absolutely correct. It's a perfect and beautiful assumption. Where the Node.js assumption falls flat on its face is if I can imagine, you know, in the shopping cart metaphor, you know, when you're at the grocery store. Um, in North America, there are often people who will go with two shopping carts. And they'll go to the checkout. And if you have five items, you don't want to be stuck behind a person with two shopping carts, right? Because you're going to be sitting there going, I'm going to have to wait all this time. So what the shopping malls have done, the shopping in the grocery stores, they have created a line that says, five items or less, right? Because there are people who only just want to get their couple of things and get out. So you see, the shopping malls know that there's some people who are really long and some people who are really short. 
if you have those type of applications where there's one request that take a long time, that is where you have to delegate it out. You cannot run it in native JavaScript because you're going to kill Node.js. But if you're just making database requests and just putting up the page and putting it together, Node.js is fine. It'll run fast. All right. Let's now look at the, the architecture of Node.js. The underlying architecture of Node.js is V8. That's the Chrome JavaScript engine. If you're running the Chrome browser, you will automatically in Node.js have that JavaScript engine running. What makes, it, uh, what makes the Chrome JavaScript engine so good is that it's actually a compiler. If I go into the web and I look for uh, V8 Chrome, there we go. Here it is. It's the V8 is implemented C++ and is used in Google Chrome, but you can also run it standalone or it can be embedded into any C++ application. That's what Node.js has done. What makes no, uh, V8 so powerful is it actually compiles. See, the, it was in the past when you ran JavaScript code, it would maybe put it into uh, an immediate language, like an interpreted language, like a bytecode. Then what would happen is that bytecode would be executed. However, that bytecode is not as efficient as .NET bytecode, or sorry, C Sharp bytecode, or Java bytecode. It's just a virtual machine that was kind of running. Chrome goes beyond that, and what it basically does is it sits there, takes JavaScript, and compiles it into native code. So basically into assembly. The, in previous JavaScript implementations or previous implementations of compiling a dynamic language to static language is that it doesn't work, right? C++ is not dynamic. C++ is static. You compile it and you do enough, it, it just stays that way. The way that people make things dynamic in C++ is they do function pointer arithmetic. They play around with pointers. The Chrome engine is very clever in that it's one of the first JavaScript dynamic, it's one of the first dynamic compilation systems where even though it's totally dynamic code, the resulting assembler is optimized dynamic code and it's very efficient. You see, I didn't believe that at first because I've had a lot of experience with this and running it in different implementations, but cr Google did it. Google did a kick-ass job. They really did. And if you look at their underlying design decisions on how they create the dynamics and keep the full richness of JavaScript, uh, it's, it's quite impressive. They know how to do the pointer arithmetic. They know how to do the objects so that you don't waste time going through the tree and you have an optimized dynamic engine. Now, of course, this... Converted code can then, is then a static module that you can run, but it also includes, by given, a garbage collector. Right? So you can allocate, deallocate. You don't see any difference from running it as an interpreter or running it as a compiled unit. So that's the first part of Node.js. The second part of Node.js, which is crucial, is that it uses the libEV library. The libEV library is a library where there is a bunch of event, sorry, where there is a mechanism that you can build up an event uh, publish subscribe type pattern. For those of you who are old, old Windows 3.1 programmers or Windows 3.0 programmers or even just Windows API programmers, you'll know this as the event loop, the Windows event loop, the pump. Right? This is exactly the same thing, right to a T. The difference is, is that it's a generic. You see, the Windows event loop in Windows API required that you create a window. This does not require for you to create a window. If you had Windows, it could use that, but it's just a generic set of pointers. Oh, look, here's an event. Oh, look, do this. And it just gets all these events thrown around. 
So in this case, if you want to look at this code, what it basically does, there's a C library called ev init, set up the listening socket, here is where we set the event, and here is where we add the event to the loop. And then we just start dispatching it. You're not going to write this code. I'm just showing this to you as a basic understanding of what's happening at the low level. All right, this is not JavaScript, this is C. You're not going to be writing C. Right? You're going to be writing JavaScript. But it uses this type of low-level library to set up these events that are then picked up. If you had to write an optimization where you wanted to really run certain things really fast, then of course you would go down to this level. You would start writing in C or C++, calling up the event loop and running the entire system. The second important library is the event-based input-output library. Let's go back to the source code here. Do you see this right here, create server? This is actually an HTTP call. And in the HTTP call, um, you are using the libio. It's saying, hey, look here, here's the callback when I get a request on the socket. Of course, there's also like the HTTP translation and so on that's in the mean, but essentially it's just saying, oh, here's a socket, here's an accept, let's process it. That's where the asynchronous comes by. So it's, what, what happens is if you can now start putting it all together, you have the libev library. You call in with JavaScript and you say, look, here's an event handler when there's a socket request coming in. And here's the JavaScript code I want you to call. So it comes out of that. It, the program starts running. A request comes in. And what it does is it says, okay, when you are not running JavaScript, remember, single-threaded model, I will call up the event. And for the most part, you're not going to be running doing anything, right? Because if you look at this script, the original script, see what happens here? You do initial configure, you get the libraries, you create the server, you configure the server, you set the error function, you set up the listen to the port, you set up the other listeners, you set up the handler for which URLs, you set up, you set up, and then at the end it says listening on port such and such. Essentially what you're doing is you're running a script, your configuration script. That's what I would like to call this. That's the configuration phase, because it runs through the JavaScript and says, okay, for this event, do this. For that handler, do that. For that, do that, do that. And then what happens is the script steps back and says, okay, let's go for it. Let me, let me wait till some events come in. And as the events come in, your functions are called. That's why Node.js can be fast, because it can do these things. Because what you're going to be doing is you're going to be stepping back and you're going to be waiting until an event is triggered. The problem is, and this is where I'm kind of getting at, is if you in your events start to sit there and put in all of this type of stuff which just takes too long to process, well then, yeah, you're going to lock up the server. Because it's sitting there processing this event and saying, hey, come on, come on, come on, come on. I'd like to, that's why you would need to delegate this out into another event. So what would happen is, and this is how you would do it, you'd say, oh, look, here's an event for another. Great. Another takes a long time to calculate. Well, I just create an event that's at the lower level that has a threading off or process or some child, uh, uh, child worker type strategy. I say start it. At that point, you relinquish control to some other functionality that then starts processing. That is how you would do it properly in Node.js. That is entirely functional programming. And it takes a little bit the mind to wrap around a bit, that you kind of get and go, oh, okay, this is what I need to do. Because one of the things that happens when you're all running on this type of event type programming is you lose control. Right? We are so used to sitting there in our program, do step, 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 step. We don't like saying, well, in case this event, do this. In case of this event, do that. In case of this event, do that. Because what you're basically doing is message type programming. Right? That's what it, this is really essentially boiling down to.
a whole bunch of messages that are coming through, except we call them events. All right. Um, let's continue on. Now, the thing is, is if you're wanting to sit there and extend Node.js, there's three ways that you might want to extend it. The first way is you just want to write plain old vanilla JavaScript code. The second way is you want to write Node.js type module. And the third way is you want to write a V8 native module. Yeah, actually, that was my reaction to You didn't see it, but I saw it. He, I know what you can do, and you're a good programmer. And he went like, yeah, and that's actually how I did too. Because when I looked at it and doing that, it's like, wow, it, that, that's heavy duty. If you really need to do that, there are reasons to do that. You better know your C++. Okay? So what I now want to do is I want to just play around a little bit with Node.js just to get you a feel, uh, give you a taste of what this environment does and how it works and, and so on. So let's go back. And we're going to delete this, okay? We don't want this. Let's run the server. And let's go back to the... There, send a message. Again, it doesn't look that spectacular, but let's take a look at where this came from. If you look at the code, it's right here. Let's just put a breakpoint there so that you can see that that event is being called. Do you see? It's being called. What happens is it's saying, I have a request at the root, or any URL, and you're now saying, I want to do a render of the res. So what's res defined as? Well, res is uh, the response. Now, if I go here, I can take a look at what objects and properties and methods there are. What I want to do is I want to sit there and say, well, no, you know what you're trying to do? You're actually taking a Jade file. And a Jade file is a sort of templating system. And if you look at it, let's, take a, let's see if we can find index.jade. Let's kill this. And we have it here. This you look at and you go, really? Let's see if I can change something. Send a message to me. All right. Um, let's run this. Uh, let's get rid of this breakpoint. Send a message to me. Mm, sounds good. Uh, let's just keep experiment sent to me again. Okay. It's a link. Oh, we have some dynamic, so I can click. Now, the reason I'm sort of saying this is a link is you see it has AID. If I look at the view page source, what I do, okay, you kind of have to find it. Uh, send a message to me. There we go. A. ID is sender. So I go here is sender. Okay, great. I'm going to sit there and type in more stuff. More stuff to me. I go on and I hit refresh. Whoa, I have stuff to me. Let's look at page source. Let's look at where stuff to me is. Ah. We have a tag. The reason why I'm experimenting is whenever I look at technologies, I actually play a monkey. Right? I, I sit there and I just type in and I see what comes out at the other end because you know, at that point, you're kind of like, okay, if I'm going to break it or not break it and so on. Well, there's a couple of things that are now happening. I'm kind of seeing a pattern. This here is an XML tag or an HTML tag. So right now, more is kind of not right. This is kind of goofy because you're kind of going, is this another tag? And indeed, with the uh, web, um, WebStorm 5.0, yeah, this is will become another tag. What you need to do is you need to define um, where is it? There it is. That. The continuation character. You're kind of like looking at this and I'm going, what on earth are you trying to do? You're introducing the continuation character. There's this letter there. There's... All right. 
templating. PHP. When I sit there and run PHP code, the way that PHP code runs is it loads up the script, it looks for the magical PHP tag, and then what it does is it sits there and says, ah, okay, this is PHP code, I can run it. Now, PHP code can then generate HTML. And your entire script goes like that. And what ends up happening is that you have a hodgepodge on your page of this is kind of HTML, this is kind of JavaScript, this is kind of something else. You know, it's all mixed. What Jay tries to do is it tries to convert the HTML document object generation into an object-oriented hierarchical system. Let's say I'm generating a web page. Most of the times when you generate a web page, you're going to generate a header and you're going to generate a footer. You don't put the HTML code into every PHP page to say, okay, this is how my header will look. What you do instead is you'll typically have a reference that generates a header for me. And then that reference is copied into each of the pages. Everyone with me on that? Okay. So what now this means is that it, I can, if I do an object-oriented hierarchy, I could actually define base HTML objects and then override certain behavior. Look at the first line. Extends layout. Is there a layout? Indeed there is. What is layout? Well, layout is an HTML, no JavaScript, lang equals ing. Look at this here, head. This is the header tag. You see, it's all indented. So the HTML is the root tag, that's like the body. Then we have a header, and then we have all of these different items which specify other HTML tags. When you have a bracket, what you're doing is you're defining attributes of the HTML tag. So in this case, what they've actually done is they said, okay, within the body, we have three blocks, the header, the content, and the footer. Let's go back to index. Let me see if there's any blocks. Indeed, there is block content. So what's happening is, is that Jade, in an object-oriented system, has created inheritance. You define the basic template at the bottom, You'd split it up into three different blocks. Let's go back to it. Here, header, content, and footer. And then, in the specific pages, you just override the content block. So whatever is in the base gets overwritten. It's a very primitive and simple inheritance, but it is inheritance nonetheless. This is what makes Jade interesting. Now, you're going to have to get used to the notation. Like, for example, this continuation character, which what it basically means, if, if I look at this code right here as it stands, what gets generated is div more stuff to me. Is this another tag? A ID equals sender send to me again. A, and then UL, so on, receive. That's what all of this generates. It's, in a way, look, look when, I, when I first saw this, and I first started using this, I was like going, are you really kidding me? I mean, come on, this is hideous. But then I've come to realize the problem with web applications is there's really no easy way to sit there and define a web UI without somewhere something looking hideous, right? Because web UIs tend to be very dynamic and they tend to be one thing overriding another and it tends to get a bit messier. Is this 100% perfect? No, it's not 100% perfect, but it's not bad and you get used to it. What is especially helpful I'm not trying to sell WebStorm here. I'm really not, okay? I don't, I, I, Hadi is a guy I've known for a while. Uh, I just, actually, I think this is just a great tool. I'm thankful that they actually have all the color syntaxing to make sure that I know what is what and how so that you understand. 
All right, so that's, base, that's the uh, templating uh, of Jade. Now what I want to do is I want to sit there and create another module. So let's do this. There. And in this code, I'm going to say console.log hello world. So now I go in and I'm going to define in my deb oh no, not debug main, sorry. I need to do another configuration. Edit configurations uh, plus uh, module tester. All right. And the path that we want to define is module runner. There we go. Click OK. And if we run this, there we go. Uh, why is that? That shouldn't be the case. Why did module tester? Let me just see. Run. Edit configurations. Module runner. Module tester. Local bin. Another project. Module runner. Um, let me just do this here. Wait. Module tester. Ah, there we go. Clicked the wrong button at the wrong place. It was actually running the other one. Okay, there you see. Hello world. What I want to do is I want to call up another JavaScript. You see, you're not going to sit there and put everything into one JavaScript. You're actually going to put it into other JavaScripts. So what I need to do is I need to create a module. I have some canned code, which I'm going to get. And it's not here. It's right here simple module. I'm going to copy this and I'm going to create a document called simple module. And then I'm going to put in exports.answer equals 42, exports.callme equals so and so. Now, in the caller, I have to sit there and call it up this way. If I run this, you'll see your message, what I'm calling, number 42. This is another very key, important aspect to understand about Node.js and a JavaScript engine. When I'm running on an HTML browser, uh, a JavaScript script, and within the HTML browser, I have a reference to another page, you know, script load, right, that I load in the script. Every variable that is within that script is automatically shown at the same level. Do, do you, does everyone understand where I'm getting at? Or who here is kind of going, what are you trying to get at? Who here doesn't understand what I'm, what I'm getting at? Okay. So what you basically have is you have the problem where variables and functions that exist within the script are being shown in the global scope. Node.js gets around that by loading up every JavaScript file in its own namespace, right? You see, the advantage of that approach is that if I load up, and right here, like look at this, do you see right here where I say exports.answer equals 42, exports.call me? Normally, if I was to write a function to call, it would sit there and be shown. All of these details would be shown to the other one. So if I was to do this, this is internal function. In any browser-based solution, I could do this. Like that. But you can't in Node.js, you can't because what happens is this here is loaded into its own namespace and the only way to get access to that namespace is through 
the require keyword. So what require does is it goes in and it loads up that JavaScript file, loads it up into its own namespace, and then it exports whatever you've defined as exports. It looks for the exports object. So for example, here you have exports.answer, exports.callMe. Like, let's try this out. Let's put in internal function, hello. Okay, let's do this. And let's see if in module runner, I actually can see internal function. Let's run it. No, it, gets, it throws an exception. Internal function is not defined. This is ingenious. This is really ingenious. They actually did this very cleverly. And what it means is that that right there is kept as an internal function. So that if you want to do more complex processing, you can do it. You don't have to worry that somehow you're going to be standing on some other JavaScript or overriding it. The only thing that's external that can be viewed and referenced is exports, anything with prefix with an exports. So if I actually go into the various node modules, um, let's, uh, let me see. Uh, that's not a good one that I, ch formidable. Let, let's, uh, let's not use that one. Let's use, let's take a look at this one. There. There, you see? Var compiler equals module dot exports. You'll see all of that referenced everywhere. Do you see here, require? That's basically what it's doing is loading. Now, one of the other things that you can do is you don't have to define your um, module within the same directory. What you might want to do is you might want to define the module within the modules directory. So for example, here, we have the various different node modules. So I want to create my module. Actually, I need to name it the same. Yeah, my module. So what I want to do is I want to name my module. And then what I want to do is I want to create a lib directory. Then what I want to do is I want to create a set of files. So I'll copy code again. Just the same code. Like that. At this point, and then when you want to reference it, instead of putting the little dot, do you see this little dot? You can just say my module. So let's just get rid of this. Let's do this, and let's do this. Let's run this. Uh, let's get rid of internal function, because uh, that's going to disrupt. And you'll see that, oh, wait a minute. It hasn't found my module. What gives? This is the other thing that you're going to see in Node.js. Most of the things are all organization based on trust, right? You see, when I created this lib directory, I actually didn't need to create that lib directory. That's just a common nomenclature of what you do to sit there and define a good module. You'll see when you go to the Node.js website, they make, they write quite a bit of documentation where they say, this is what you should create. This is the documentation file. This is how you should do this. Because they, what they want to do is they want to enforce a certain amount of consistency. Without that consistency, let's be real, JavaScript can be a bleeding nightmare, right? I mean, we don't want to create Perl version 2, right? Except it's with JavaScript. So what I'm missing right now is an index file, index.js. And within the index.js file, do you see here, module.exports. What I'm doing is I'm using the reserved keyword 
to say, look, I know you're looking for my module, but I'm actually exporting most of the stuff in another file. This way you can create a whole bunch of JavaScript and create it as classes, right? You know, we're used to in C Sharp, each, even though it doesn't need to be, but each class file, each class is its own file for the most part. This is how they do it in JavaScript. So you're saying, ah, this is the lib my module or the class my module. So now, if I run this, now it should run without any problems. There you go. Your message, what am I calling 42 hello world? Okay. Um, let's go back to the slide deck. All right, conclusion. I've given you a basic taste of JavaScript, of Node.js, sorry. This talk was only there to give you the essence. I showed you how to create a module. I showed you what Jade is about. I showed you that it's single-threaded and function callback, and I showed you how to go kaboom with Node.js. But I also talked about why Node.js is the way it is. So now the only thing left, if you think that this is something for you, well, now you can start coding in it with the right perspective so that you don't fall into these little funny traps. Um, I, I really recommend WebStorm IDE, okay? You see, if there's one thing Microsoft does right, they make good IDEs. Right? They don't expect you to sit there and pull up Emacs or Vi or whatever. Right? They have a good IDE. WebStorm is a great IDE. You know, use it for Node.js. You'll like it. It even has IntelliSense. It has finding. It's, it's good with debugging. The code is compiled. This is the other thing. Node.js compiles its code. You can create compiled native modules. You, the the, the Node.js developers from the get-go decided to use as little native code as possible. They really wanted Node.js to be almost self-compilable. And it does get there. Overall, Node.js is best suited for messaging type applications. It's fantastic for that. You can run an HTTP server. I don't disagree that you can't do that, but you need to understand the concept of workers. workers. Right? Uh, there is a discussion in a Node.js of workers. So you can kind of then thread off of that and continue on with that. Would I recommend it? Um, look, I've been in this industry a long time, and the question becomes, is Node.js something that I would use myself? And the answer is yes and no. All right? um, if you have to do a brand new project, if you have to do actually something that has use of messaging and you understand it, absolutely. Not, the IDE is uh, good, the environment is good, the performance is not bad. Okay, it's not going to be native C++, but it's good enough. It's usable in that context. There's a lot of libraries, there's a lot of support. And therefore I say it's actually not bad. It's, act it's a pretty good environment. With that, I wrap up my session, and also with that, um, I'm a little bit sad now at this because, I don't know, some of you might know me for a very long time, 15 years, right? Well, do you see what's sitting on my table? It's an apple, right? And 15 years, I've been going to Busta. This is my last one. I'm not going to Busta again. Um, I'm, I'm moving on. And it's a little bit sad because, you know, you kind of get to see, like yourself, you know, see each other all the time. So, you know, I hope you guys have a good Busta. Thank you. You guys have been a great audience. Thank you. All right.